Hello, and welcome to Victoria and the Spy. This is a fan-made Genshin Impact visual novel dating sim in which you get the chance to romance Il Dottore, one of the members of the Fatui in Genshin Impact. I cover all 10 endings in this, so if there is a particular one that you would like to see, please refer to the timestamps that I put in the description box below. Let's put our name in. So yeah, you play as a gender-neutral MC in this one. My name is Yini. I am a student from the Academia. Due to certain events, Yini will be expelled from the Academia without further notice. I have been assigned a mission... No, no, wait. Offered a chance to return to the Academia in case I can complete a task to make up for my faults. That's what the sages said. They were kind enough to prepare everything, including the carriage I entered a few hours ago. For now, all I have to do is wait until we arrive at the final destination. I should take another look at the mission details. To Yinni, blah blah, mission to obtain, blah blah blah, information about the Harbinger Il Dottore. I can't believe I really accepted this mission. I must be crazy, as well as out of alternative options and in depth. They even included background information about the fake identity they made for me. My whole role is sketchy. Apparently the sages want me to play the role of a very unimportant Fatui agent. My role states that I have been La Signora's subordinate, at least until her death. They fake some papers stating that I've been transferred to work under Il Dottore. They have almost no available information on him. Yet, there are rumors about him and his speculated attendance to a certain event. The sages want me to attend the ball. I didn't expect the Fatui to do anything like this. Uh, anyway, there are more details. Oh, seems someone has prepared an accommodation in town near the venue where the event will take place. Now I just need to wait until my carriage arrives. Suddenly, the driver at the front speaks up. We will arrive at our destination in some minutes. Please make sure to prepare for the cold weather outside. Oh, just in time. You leave the carriage and find yourself in a deserted and snow-covered marketplace. The high bare wall, the surrounding buildings, and the empty streets make it seem like a ghost town. You can see lights flickering behind the windows of surrounding buildings which are covered in snow as well. An unpleasant silence lies over the plaza. Only the wind whistles pitilessly through the deserted streets. You nod your thanks to the driver, who returns your gesture and immediately sets off on his way out of the region of eternal winter. Now you're standing there alone, in the middle of a land that is neither benevolent to you nor to your homeland. Behind the frost crystal covered windows, you recognize the outlines of some of the residents and decide to look for your prepared accommodation as well. The snow beneath your shoes crunches almost hypnotically as the cold creeps through your thick warm clothing. You can't stay out here in the cold forever. After some searching, you find a snow-covered inn with lights on. Oh, wait, is this, I wonder if this, is this a random NPC or is this like a character in Genshin? I, I've never played Genshin before, I only play Honkai. You enter the inn and are greeted by the receptionist at the front desk. Welcome, my name is Alexandru. You hand over one of the papers from the envelope with details about the reserved room. The receptionist smiles slightly, rummages through even more papers under his desk, and finally hands over a tiny key. He hesitates as he notices your tense posture. You're new to the Fatui, right? Is this your first time attending the ball? You nod, still tense, unable to get a word out. Seems like there are quite a lot of newbies this year. Don't worry, everyone went through that stage once. Enjoy your stay! Thank you, have a nice evening. You shoulder your backpack and take the stairs, which will lead you to your room on the first floor. With the key, you open the door and enter your room. It is small, spartanly furnished, and radiates something uncomfortable. Still, it's better than standing outside in the cold. A small fire burns in the partly dirty fireplace. You swiftly empty the contents of your backpack on the hard mattress of the bed. Next to your formal attire intended for the event, lie the detailed notes containing information regarding the mission. They seem to have caught your eye again. Your gaze wanders back and forth between the notes and the fire. I wonder if I should burn them. I feel like we should burn these. You know, because what if, what if they find them? You throw the sheets of paper into the blazing flames. The paper begins to crackle, curl, and finally turn to ash. It's better this way. 
Since the ball will not take place until the following evening, you decide to go to bed. Sleep will do you good after a long journey. The next day, you wake up the next morning. After a quick glance out the window, you realize that it's still cold and the sky is covered in thick grey clouds. You have a lot of time on your hands. A bath. I need to take a bath to make a good impression this evening. And maybe I'll even get to meet some of the other Fatui members around here. Once again, you shoulder your bag and head down to the reception. Good morning. Already up? You nod, but say nothing. You know he's with the Fatui, yet he seems so... kind. How can I help you? Is there any place where I could take a shower or a bath? Of course. Down the street, on the right, is a public bathhouse. Just head inside, the entrance is free for all of us. Thank you for the advice. Turn tensely, you force a smile. Us, the Fatui. At least, he seems to believe you're one of them. You make your way down the street. In contrast to the previous evening, several people are now out and about in the streets. Some of them wear typical Fatui clothes, while others wear only small badges or masks. From afar, you can spot the bathhouse. It is larger than many of the surrounding buildings and has small decorative elements on the windows and door frames. Despite the cold, the door is still slightly ajar, so you venture inside. With every step you take, the icy cold subsides from you. Finally, you reach an area that serves as a changing room. The space is angled with many corners and partitions to create a little privacy. At the edge of the room, you discover small compartments for baggage. You take off your clothes, stow them in a locker, and get a chance to eavesdrop on the conversation. Yes, exactly. I'm getting nervous only thinking about that. Oh, don't worry. It'll be a great evening. Sure. Rumors say that even the Harbingers will be present. Promise. I've already had the privilege of meeting the 11th Harbinger once. Chill day? Well, if I was a subordinate to him, I would definitely be as carefree as you are. Chill day is Tartaglia, right? I, I've been seeing a lot of art with him and uh, Riesley lately on Twitter. Oh, you're nervous about the rumors that some of Il Dottore's subordinates are inexplicably disappearing, aren't you? Yes. Don't be. Rumors are just rumors, not fact. The sound of their footsteps follows as the two head out of the changing room. Silence falls. By the Archons, I hope none of those rumors are true. I just want to go back to the academy and graduate, not to infiltrate the Fatui. Besides, I appreciate the chance I was given, but why of all people? Me. You try to get those ever-circling thoughts out of your head and leave the room to take a hot bath. You don't know how much time you spent in the bathhouse, but it was worth every minute. With a clear head and a clean body, you finally leave the bathhouse and return to the inn. Just as expected, the receptionist is still there. He shoots you a calm smile as you walk past the front desk and take the stairs. Just as you fiddle the key from your coat pocket, steps behind you attract your attention. Oh hi! Is that your room? Awesome, mine's right next to you. Seems like we're room neighbours. I'm Taja. Nice to meet you, neighbour. You know, she's one of the Fatui. Yet you somehow had imagined them differently. Kind of more distanced. I'm sure you're just excited as me, right? I mean, only a few hours left. You're also attending the ball, huh? Why else would you travel here and stay at the inn? Usually, this town's quite deserted. Only once a year as the ball takes place, the town gets flooded by visitors. I met some nice people last year, but haven't seen them around here. At least not until now. Maybe we'll meet again at the venue. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Yinni. Call me Yinni. Nice to meet you, Yinni. I'm sorry, but I need to go and get ready for the event. Sh you surely want to do the same, am I right? Taja continues to babble and giggle as she slowly, very slowly, approaches the door to her own room. See you later. She unlocks the door and enters her room. As the door closes, silence returns. Right, I should prepare for the ball. At least I now know two names and rumours about Il Dottore. Probably not enough yet. You enter your room and take some minutes to process the conversation. As the time passes, it gets even darker outside, so you decide to finally put on your attire for the event. The fabric is soft, almost silky, and still smells like home. Its pure bright white reminds you of your dasha, of your dasham, the academia, and the time you spent there. Small, golden, and bluish accents add a certain flair to the outfit. You glance down at yourself and turn around, testing the movement range. You look perfect, perfect to infiltrate the Fatui. You sigh and take a look outside. As the evening approaches, members begin to emerge from the surrounding houses. 
like moths drawn to the light, they make their way to the place where the ball is to be held. From your window, you can spy an almost palace-like building in the distance. You doubt it to be the palace of the Tsaritsa. After all, you don't believe any unimportant Fatui agent will be granted the honor to set foot on sacred ground. You slip into your Fatui winter coat and head out into the street to join the stream of people wandering to the gathering place. You finally reach the venue. Oh boy, I'm scared. I'm nervous. Near the entrance, you spot two guards inspecting the arriving guests with critical glances. As you approach the entrance, heart beating fast, your thoughts start to circle around one thing. What if I get caught? You know this as one of the guards eyes you critically and accidentally makes eye contact. He calls you over with a slight gesture. Nervously, you follow his invitation. Just as you're about to greet him politely, you hear a high-pitched voice calling out. Hey, Yinny! You turn around and spy a familiar face within the continuing stream of guests flooding the entrance. Isn't that... Glad you made it in time. With effort, she makes her way through the crowd and finally reaches you. She gives you a bright smile, places a hand on your shoulder, and directs you towards the staircase which leads to the ballroom. The guard seems to know Taja. He sighs and lets both of you pass. Quickly, you and Taja hand in your cloak and now enter the hall in suitable formal clothing. You fit in perfectly. The air is quite warm and almost stuffy. Chatter and laughter echo off into the high, nicely decorated walls as more members push past you into the hall. At the sight of some of the other members, Taja lets out a small squeal of excitement, gives you a quick smile, and then disappears into the crowd. As far as you can tell, you don't feel any hidden intentions in Taja's actions. She seems to be just nice and naive so far. You don't recognize any of the faces. All seem to be nameless, unimportant members. I know nothing about the Fatui and their people. The sages couldn't have made a choice worse than sending me, but I can proudly say I made it inside the venue. The hall fills more and more with each passing minute, until those present finally fall silent. From the opposite end of the hall, you hear a soft, indistinct voice. Amidst all the rustling of clothes and the occasional murmur, you don't understand the word. The opening speech finishes shortly after, and at once the members present fall into chatter again. Small groups form, opening several corridors to the hall. A sweet smell indicates a buffet nearby, while your gaze is fascinated by some couples dancing in the middle of the ballroom. The fast movements of the dancing crowd almost make you forget why you're here. Then, out the corner of your eye, you spot something familiar. With a jerk, you turn your head to the side and take a closer look at the person who caught your attention. Oh, he's here! Also, he's cute too. I like his outfit. You recognize him. He's standing at the edge of the crowd, quietly observing the cheerful quietly observing the cheerful hustle and bustle. Il Dottore himself. Some months ago, at the Academia's archive, this is interesting. Notes about the Ruin Guards, hidden in old boxes, stuffed in even older shelves. And who is Zandik? The sages told me about Il Dottore, about Zandik. I read his own notes and judging by that, he knows a lot. Il Dottore seems to be searching for something, or someone. You, your mission, you have a job to do. What now? Uh, I'm starting a conversation. You make your way through the crowd, and then you stand in front of him. Silently, you stare at him for a while. He doesn't acknowledge you and still stares spellbound into the distance. Good evening. Il Dottore doesn't move a muscle, yet you have a feeling that he's watching you with an attentive gaze under his mask. Il Dottore? Finally, he turns his head and faces you. Correct? That's me? You can't see his eyes, but you still have the feeling that he seems to be staring at you. The other guests don't seem to notice you, or perhaps they just don't dare to turn around and look at the harbinger. My name is Yinny. Almost imperceptibly, Il Dottore tilts his head. Audacious. Excuse me? Audacious. To oh my god, his teeth. I have a, <laughs> I have a weakness for like sharp teeth. I don't know why. Audacious to address me in public and introduce yourself. Instinctively, you jerk back a step. The coldness in his voice sends a shiver down your spine. 
and a grin spreads across his face. You're unusual. Almost interesting. After La Signora's passing, I was reassigned to serve under your command. Ah, of course. Il Tore, is there anything to do for me? Oh, you seem to take your duties quite earnestly. However, the night takes place in the spirit of... Fun. Now speak. Who calls for me? Pantalone? Nobody. Oh? Then what might be the reason for someone like you to approach a harbinger like me? Curiosity? Curiosity? You nod slightly and smile in a polite way. People are talking about the Harbingers, especially about a very capable man with great knowledge about Ruin Guards and their technology. Oh, is that so? What are those rumours about exactly? Things I don't even dare to imagine. A small chuckle escapes Ildatore's throat. He slightly bows and reaches his hand out to you. I would like to continue this conversation. May I ask for a dance? You take a moment to think. He does not seem suspicious about you and your disguise. Could it be pure interest? An unusual encounter? Is that what he's been looking for? It's an honour. It only took a couple of steps to reach the middle of the ballroom. Your eyes are fully fixed on his lips as a slight smirk shows his satisfaction about you accepting his request. Let me kiss now. Aww, yay! We get the, we get the first CG. Oh, this is drawn so well. I love the background. Also, his teeth. Are his teeth like that in the game as well? Like a rock in the water, you split the flowing current of the other dance couples as you hesitate. Your hand is resting in his. <laughs> his touch is gentle, yet you realize he's trying to lure you. It's a game, and he knows how to take advantage of every single rule to win. You feel the fleeting glances of the other guests resting on you. Was it envy? Or perhaps pity? Almost as if in a trance, you let Ildatore pull you closer and feel him place his other hand on your back, barely noticeable. He knows the other guests are also staring. He also knows that the other harbingers, who are also present, have noticed you. Then your dance begins. He leads. Quite well, in fact. It only takes a few moments for you to connect with him, and the two of you are striding through the ballroom in the same rhythm as the other pairs. As the music plays its stirring notes over and over, you become somewhat accustomed to his sudden closeness. A little unsettled, you quickly cast a sideways glance. People are still giving you a cursory stare. Worry? Of course they stare, thinking they're not being watched. After all, they know who I am, and so they wonder who you are even more. And why you are given the honour of this dance. They seem mistrustful. A soft but well-knowing laugh escapes his lips. Would there be any reason to be suspicious of you? No, I... Envious would probably have been a more appropriate term. A certain amount of distrust or scepticism in this case is quite appropriate. It keeps the mind focused. You feel his grip on your hand tighten. An interesting encounter. That's all you are to him. I could say similar things about him. The music picks up speed. You adapt your steps effortlessly to the fast tempo. Il Dottore lapses into silence again, and for a moment the fixed smile he had on his lips during your conversation fades. Then with a jerk, he pulls you a little closer to him, closing the gap between the two of you. Only now do you notice his scent. You can't compare it to anything you know, yet you do not perceive it as unpleasant. He's close. Very close. In a soft, gentle voice, he makes you an offer. Since you're now under my supervision, you don't really have the right to refuse, but I'm still interested in your honest opinion. A curious mind can be schooled. Consider this an invitation. I accept. A satisfied grin spreads on his lips. Your steps still follow the pattern of the dance. He had anticipated your quick acceptance. The play is coming to an end. The last chords ring out. The last steps are taken. Then the musicians fall silent and the dancing couples come to a standstill. You also pause. His grip on your hand loosens. 
lowering his voice so that his words reach only your ears. He continues. You're free to spend the rest of the evening as you wish. Meanwhile, I will arrange everything necessary. When and where... Don't break your pretty little mind over that. Leave everything to me. He bows his head slightly, which is supposed to be a sort of unobtrusive bow, and then turns on his heel. As soon as your hand separates from his, new couples of dancers stream into the center of the hall and rush between you and him. For a few seconds, you can follow him with your gaze, until finally you lose sight of him completely. In an instant, the place in which he stood seconds ago gets filled by other guests. Trying to make a way through the crowd, you accidentally stumble over some feet and mumble a hasty excuse. Suddenly, a hand grabs your arm and pulls you harshly backwards. Oh hey, Yinny. Where are you going? Your eyes focus on Taja's dress for a second, then wandering over to four other people close to her. As she notices you curiously eyeing her company, she starts to giggle happily. <laughs> oh, oh, may I introduce you? She turns around, bubbling to her friend. This is my neighbor Yinny, living in the room right next to mine. After the short but warm introduction, her friends decide to head over to a group of, to another group of friends. You start to wonder if everyone here is on good terms with the others. Taja stays with you, takes your hands, and pulls you to the edge of the crowd. Uh, I don't want to seem overly curious, but I really need you to give me the details. But details about what? She giggles, moves closer, and points to the spot where you have been standing with Il Dottore minutes ago. You dance with the second harbinger, Il Dottore. Excitedly, she squeezes your hand and giggles again. I still can't believe you've been granted that honor. I mean, Il Dottore himself offered a dance to you? I've already come across him several times, but he didn't even bother to talk to me. I wonder what's on his mind every time he just stands there and stares silently. Your gaze quickly scans the lively hall. Besides some of Taj's friends and other low rank members, you can't spot any of the Harbingers. Looking for him? She giggles and gives your shoulder a nudge. I'm sure all of the Eleven have gathered in a more quiet area. After all, they surely have important matters to discuss. And I know this because I've helped with the preparations. They will be served exquisite meals. A proud smile spreads on her lips as she points over to the buffet at the end of the hall. This is for all of us. Oh, have you tried some of the specialties from the Sneshnaya? Again, she grabs your arm and pulls you through the crowd of dancing and chattering people. The seasoned scent of fresh cooked ingredients mixed and seasoned reminds you of how hungry you are. Taja makes you try almost everything, waiting for your reaction. As you two enjoy your meal, your gaze wanders through the hall again. For a moment, the lively feeling you have fades as you're reminded of the reason for your attendance. The gleeful chatters become distant and you can't help but think back to the time. You were at Sumeru's marketplace. Everything is so different now. When exactly did things go wrong? You sigh, catching Taja's attention. Yet, she seems to misinterpret your facile expression. Full already? Come on, there's still much more to taste and test. Without hesitation, you let yourself get pulled along another time. As your culinary journey continues, Taja tells you a lot about the other members present. It seems you're in luck because the amount of information she gives you voluntarily is more than enough. Yet your goal is Il Dottore himself, so you find yourself scanning the crowd multiple times hoping to spot that turquoise hair again. Ex to your disappointment, none of the harbingers show up again except Pulcinella, who seems to actually enjoy some small talk. As the time passes, you can't help but notice the continuing stares of the other guests. Wondering if it's related to your dance or your new friend Taja, you decide to focus on your food and the stuff Taja tells you. This evening progresses rapidly, as you soon start to feel a light tiredness cloud your mind. After some more chit chat with Taja, you decide to return to the inn. You don't want to let any information about your disguise slip by accident, considering how tired you are. On the way out, you have the feeling of being watched. Your thoughts are still circling around this unusual encounter with Il Dottore. In the notes, he had been described completely differently. Either his interest is genuine, or he knows what I'm up to. Alone, you make your way back to the inn. The cold winter winds blow snow in your face, so you arrive at the inn freezing and shivering. It's eerily quiet here. Of course, most, if not all, are at the celebration. Without further encounter, you ascend the inn stairs and reach your room. 
Swiftly, you open the door with a clinking key, step inside, and find a letter lying at your feet behind the door. Curious, you pick it up and open it. Inside, you find a handwritten note with a time that you'll be picked up tomorrow morning. Fleetingly, you catch Ildatore's scent, which barely noticeably clings to the paper in your hand. Lost in thought, you finally go to bed. You put the piece of paper under your pillow. The next day. You wake up a few hours later. A glance at the clock tells you that the time of the scheduled encounter is near. Hastily, you get ready, gather your things, and notice that you feel queasy at the thought of the invitation. Lost in thought, you leave your room, turn in your key, and leave the inn with your belongings. Outside, the wind whistles icily through the small village. There's still no one to be seen. Protected from the wind and the view, you seek shelter behind one of the houses. You're still plagued by this strange feeling. Before long, you hear a carriage approaching. It stops in the middle of the village square and waits there, for you. But something seems strange about this carriage. The vehicle seems cold, almost mechanical. You are still hidden from the eyes of the carriage driver, as yet no one knows where you are. There's still a chance to escape, back home, but would they let you back inside the academy? Definitely not. I'm going to take flight because I think that'll get us our first ending. You wait. Very long. Very quietly. The minutes pass sluggishly, but at last the carriage starts moving again. Without you. Mission report. Yuni has made contact with the Harbinger Ildatori. However, Yuni turned down the opportunity to accept his invitation and thus obtain more information. Conclusion. Little information gained. Furthermore, the Tori will now know that he's being tracked. Yuni will not be allowed to enter the Academy or again. Oh, Ending 1. Decline Invitation. Alright, let's go back. Let's enter the carriage this time. With almost trembling knees, you stumble towards the carriage. The driver takes a quick look at you, notices that your luggage is the only small pouch that you're carrying on your back, and nods towards the door of the carriage. The metal of the handle feels icy cold under your palm. You think it's the right decision to get in. You take a deep breath, then pull the door open with a flourish and step inside. The door blows shut behind you with a small bang. Then silence returns. The howling of the wind can no longer be heard. As soon as you sit down, the carriage starts moving. It rumbles, rattles, and clicks in an unusually mechanical way. Cautiously, you glance out at the small windows. Noon is still a few hours away and you begin to wonder when you'll reach your destination. As if the driver had sensed your thoughts, he opens a small shutter at the front of the carriage for you to hear his words clearly. If you wish to take a break, please call. We'll probably reach our destination late in the evening. A short pause follows before he continues, hesitantly. It has come to my attention that one of the harbingers is awaiting your arrival there. Allow me to ask, who is it? The second of eleven. The driver hesitates, then you feel the carriage, picking up speed. Oh god. We may even reach a destination in the early evening. Enjoy the ride. Is he that scary? The small shutter closes with a dull sound. Again, you're left to your own devices. While the snowy landscape passes by your window, you can't help but keep thinking about the reason behind your current situation. The sages. I was not even allowed to state my point of view. Even if I return with new knowledge, the Academia will never be the same for me again. Except for the occasional rumble, the journey continues smoothly. The landscape outside becomes more and more desolate until the last houses have finally disappeared. Except for an endless cold ice desert, there's nothing to discover. Pushed by the wind, countless snowflakes whiz past the carriage, limiting your view into the distance. At the thought of the driver having to sit outside alone in the cold, some pity flashes through your mind. You hardly realize that it's noon, as a thick layer of clouds hovers in the sky, soaking up every last ray of sunlight. The snowstorm increases rapidly, but eventually, you believe to recognize a large outline on the grey horizon. Curious, you slide closer to the window, as the tip of your nose touches the cold glass. You instinctively flinch, but can't take your eyes off the ominous building in the distance. It's hard to tell if the carriage is actually travelling on a path. The ground is covered all over with snow, 
and even your tracks are covered again by the freshly fallen snow. And you are somewhere in the middle of nowhere. The closer you get to the outline on the horizon, the more clearly you recognize its exact shape. Almost palatial in appearance, the building sits enthroned in the middle of a small mountain. The walls are high, covered with frost and snow, and rise high into the sky. Strange, you think, the architectural style is similar to that of the building where the ball was held, but it seems far less inviting there. Your eyes scan the surrounding area again. For any lost soul, this palace would be a saving oasis in this icy wasteland. Finally, you pass a large stone entrance archway where two masked guards are posted. Their clothing is enough to identify them as Fatsui. Once again, the carriage begins to rumble as the wheels finally hit the stone ground again. You stop and you hear the footsteps of the driver who opens the door for you obligingly this time. We have arrived. With a queasy feeling, you, sh you shoulder your backpack again. Leave the warm carriage and are immediately led by two other guards through a double door into a large hall. You look around in amazement. Everything in this room seems perfectly arranged. This background's really pretty. The almost crystalline decorations look like ice crystals picked outside in the cold. The guards leave the hall, so you remain alone. Silence returns, but this time, it is absolute. No whistling winds, no rattling of carriage wheels. But just as the silence seems to become oppressive, you hear approaching footsteps. From a corridor to your right, a familiar figure emerges from the shadows. It's him! Yay! Ah, my dear Yinny. With slow but steady steps, he continues to approach you until he comes to a stop just an arm's length in front of you. I see you brought some pretty harsh weather with you. Is that your way of thanking me for inviting you? He chuckles amusedly and walks briskly past you. It's already late and you've probably already thought about where you're going to spend the night. Surprised, you listen and you hurry after him with quick steps. The resounding splash of your shoes on the bare stone floor echoes ghostly from the bleak walls. The overall atmosphere gives you chills, unsure if it's due to the actual coldness or the feeling of loneliness. After all, you're on your own in enemy territory. Well, since there's no lack of space here, I have had one of the guest rooms prepared for you. During the night, a guard will be posted at the end of the corridor whom you may harass with questions and requests. Again, a chuckle escapes him as he continues down the corridor. Who else lives here besides you? Il Dottore slows his steps, tilts his head back, and contemplates the high stone ceiling. Live here? Hmm, good question. This place is one of the many where other harbingers reside from time to time. Who are you speaking of? The one who had this place built. One requires more for this, and as far as I'm aware, there is only one among us harbingers who is eligible for this. Therefore, therefore, if there is any reason to complain about your accommodation, please bother Pantalone with it. You're somewhat surprised that the high-ranking harbinger himself gives you a guided tour through almost endlessly long corridors. And that's exactly what gives you pause for thought. What are his motives? Your curiosity? Or does he know more than he lets on? He stops in front of an inconspicuous yet discreetly decorated wooden door. With a nod, he tells you to open it. Wordlessly, you follow his instruction and enter the room behind it. Cold air hits you, and yet this room seems more inviting than your last accommodation in the city. Il Dottore is still standing at the doorstep. He's obviously reluctant to enter. You notice that Il Dottore does not set foot in the room, and you begin to wonder what may be going through his mind. Is it vanity? Or does he care about privacy? You quickly shake the thoughts away, judging from what you know so far, neither reason fits. Is it a game? Did he want you to notice his hesitation? Did he want you to think he cares about privacy? Did he want you to start pondering his thoughts? Your gaze seems to have revealed your wandering mind. At least Il Dottore notices your thoughtful scowl. Now that everything's settled so far, let me add a few important things for you to know. Dinner will be brought to your room in half an hour. Tomorrow, we will meet again. A smirk creeps onto his lips. I'm curious what news is there to report from Sumeru and the Academy are. And there he turns away from you, closes the door, and leaves you to your own devices again. How did he... Wait, how did he know that I was from the Academy? I don't believe I told him before. Yikes. The soft, 
ticking of a clock is the only sound heard. With quiet steps, you wander through the room. With your fingertips, you gently brush the cover of the bedspread. The fabric seems warm and yet soft at the same time. Definitely not of the same quality as the covers at the inn. You let your gaze wander along the narrow windows. There's nothing to see outside except white snow. But you notice that the window frames are so slender that you could not squeeze through them even with effort. Suddenly you realize that Il Dottore did not choose this room by mere accident. You still have some time before dinner, which you can put to good use. Alright, let's do some exploring. Curious, you open the door to the corridors and tiptoe out. The soft but audible sound of your footsteps echo down the empty hallway. You barely reach the end of the corridor when you flinch as you spot a partly familiar face out the corner of your eye. Oh, we know each other. Surprised, you stammer in search of words, but you can't think of anything that makes sense. It's okay, I didn't mean to scare you. For tonight, I'll keep watch here. The restrooms are straight ahead, around the corner, then the last door. Oh, thank you so much, I was looking for those. At least, he seems to believe your lie. No need to thank me. Somewhat relieved, you make your way to the restroom while your heart still flutters. You know that the guy is skeptical. He'll probably investigate every little irregularity during the night's rest. A little later, you enter your room again, stow your backpack in the closet, and take a look out the window. A resounding knock snaps you out of your thoughts and makes you wince. However, the door remains closed, so you take a look at the corridor behind it yourself. To your surprise, you find a small tray with a more or less warm meal at your feet. Your stomach is already growling, so you pick up the tray and carry it to your room. At the sight of the dinner, a strange thought overcomes you. What if it's spiked? Cautiously, you take a quick breath, but you can't find anything unusual. It is reasonable to be suspicious in this situation. But after some thought, you realize that for the time being, you will have to live and eat here for an undetermined period of time. Whether you eat this potentially poisoned meal, or the one the next morning makes no difference. Soon, night falls and you wait for a guard, or someone like that to come by and tell you to stay in your room but no one shows up. The door is still open and can only be locked with the key that is on your side. You know that it wouldn't make a very trusting impression of Il Dottore or a guard were to see you sneaking around in the castle at night. On the other hand, this would be the ideal opportunity to gather information. Your gaze wanders thoughtfully back and forth between the bed and the door. Well, I have no sense of self-preservation, so we're going to explore the castle. You tiptoe out of your room and look left and right down the hall. Except for some pale light coming through the narrow windows, there's no other source of light. From one end of the hallway, you hear a soft rustle and the occasional bored sigh. That must be one of the guards. I'll go in the other direction. Struggling not to make a sound, you wander down the cold corridor. You follow the dark hallway that unfolds before you. The sound of your footsteps is faint, but still audible. Finally, you reach a large, elaborately decorated door. Your gaze immediately lingers on the small carvings in the wood and you realize that something important could be behind this door. Gently, you place your hands on the cold wood and push the wing door inwards. A large library opens up ahead of you. Your gaze wanders up the high cram shelves. The racks seem to almost deform under their own weight. As you pass by, you run your fingertips over the spines of some of the books that are at eye level. In a hidden niche, you discover a small table, a matching chair and some books and papers scattered on the tabletop. Your heart begins to beat faster at this sight. Would this be enough for the sages to accept you back at the Academia? With trembling fingers, you reach for one of the pieces of paper to take a closer look at the characters scribbled on it. The sight of the partially smeared characters leaves you puzzled. It's impossible for you to decipher it. No matter what the secret code is, you can't read it. Still, this find is better than nothing. Hoping no one would miss a single piece of paper, you fold it up and pocket it. Then you let your eyes wander through the archive again. You're still alone so far. No one seems to have discovered you. You can return to your room or continue your exploration. Let's continue exploring. With the note in your pocket, you sneak out of the archive. The corridor leads you deeper and deeper into the threatening looking building, which appears increasingly like a labyrinth. After only a few turns and dead ends, you reach a door that is less embellished but all the more impressive for its size. 
What surprises you most is the metallic scent that lingers in the air. You approach the door, put your hand on the handle and open it, but as you do, it scrapes just across the floor and lets out a short but sharp metallic sound. Startled, you let go of the door, take a few steps back and hastily look around. No one to be seen, nothing to hear. Since the door is already open, you dare to take a look inside. Oh, oh it says, wait, there's like, there's like people up in these little contraptions here. In front of you stretches an eerie looking chamber and what you discover are all kinds of devices of which can, you can only guess what they're used for. Cables and tubes hang down the walls and run crisscross the floor and run to large glowing blue containers that hold sometimes more, sometimes less large, misshapen things. Some of them are as big as humans, others as small as embryos, oh god. A shiver runs down your spine at the sight. Just what you see here with your own eyes should have some value for the sages. But would they believe your simple, unverifiable report? As you pass by, your gaze lingers on some small, apparently preserved samples. You would have to bring tangible proof of this, but you realize that you can't just steal one or two samples from this room, that would attract attention. Somehow you have to come up with a plan to steal the samples, then leave the castle unnoticed. The last part, the escape, is the biggest problem anyway, apart from Il Dottore himself. Proud of your courage so far, yet unsure of the potential risks, you leave the lamp with quiet steps. As again you stand in the hallway, again you have to make a decision. Your curiosity drives you on and on, so you don't let anything stop you from seeking important information. I feel like this is a curiosity killed the cat type of situation. You search through long corridor after corridor until you find a staircase that leads you a long way deeper into the darkness. On tiptoe, you follow the stone path that leads you to an overwhelmingly large double door. It's a lot colder down here, so you start to shiver. The door in front of you is heavier than expected, so you need some strength to open it. The door is open a crack so you can squeeze through. Oh god, okay. You catch your breath. Countless cages and crates are piled up in this large hall. At the end you spy the railing of a balcony which makes you suspect that there's a way down even further. With soft knees, you sneak between the cages and can hardly take your eyes off of the inmates. Some of them are human, young, old, tall, short. Others are creatures seemingly from the abyss. However, they all however they all have one thing in common. They do not react to your presence. Keeping the railing in sight at some distance, you head purposely for it. When you catch a glimpse of the chasm opening up there, you're left gasping for breath. You can't tell how deep the descent is, because the darkness there restricts your vision. Then you hear footsteps, right behind you. I am so screwed! Oh, this is um one of his segments, right? Because my friend told me that um, Dottore can like clone and split himself. How did you escape from your cage? With quick glances, he examines your clothes and realizes that you are not one of the test subjects locked up here. At least not yet. Yinny, right? You take a few steps back until your back hits the railing. You feel hot. It couldn't have been a worse place to get caught. So you're the plaything that Prime brought back from the dance. I can't wait to see what he has to say about your nocturnal excursion. Uh oh. A violent dizziness overcomes you and sweeps the ground from underneath your feet. Time to go to sleep. Gradually, you regain consciousness. Your skull hums violently as if someone had smacked your head forcefully. Still dazed, you try to get up, but quickly realize that some straps drastically restrict your freedom of movement. The bright light above you gives you an idea of where you're at at the moment. The laboratory I entered after the archive, that means I'm lying on the operating table. Panic, hot as coals, and cold as ice at the same time overcomes you. The last moments you can remember flash before your eyes. He, he was there. He caught me. Efforting to turn your head but unable to do so, you try to get a better picture of your surroundings. Except for the blurred outlines lying in the shadows, you recognize nothing. Then suddenly, you hear the echoing sound of footsteps behind you. Impressive. You flinch on the inside, on the outside too. But the straps hinder your movements. Pretty brave of you to go into the lion's den in order to do some spying. You can't think of any suitable words. Your throat is dry, your head empty. There's no easy explanation to make your actions look like something else. Ilda Torre steps closer and bends down to you a bit. I have to say, I didn't expect that from you. A soft but rough giggle resounds the room. 
I had already done some research on you before you arrived, and I must say that for a former member of Academia, you were quite cunning. His footsteps move slightly away from you, and the table you're lying on as he continues his monologue. Most people at the Academy are a bore, so they don't risk anything, stick to the rules, and so on. Then you feel the tips of his gloved fingers brushing against your upper arm. You are different. You don't fit into their perfect image. Am I right? Without giving you a chance, he continues. You seem to be good test material for delusions experiments. Still under tension, you hear a door open some distance away. You can barely distinguish the sound of approaching footsteps from that of your heart beating like crazy. Finally, you see two shadows bending over you from the left and right, obscuring the glare of the lamp. Oh god, I'm so screwed. Finally, Il Dottore Prime gives his younger segment a scowl. I hope you didn't start without me. After all, cutting open is the best part. He will not be cut open at all. Seriously. At least not today. The younger one lets out a crazy giggle. <laughs> fine, fine. But what do you have planned for today's experiment then? Prime turns away for a moment, rummages on a nearby side table, and then reappears in your field of vision holding a syringe with a terrifically long needle. Why make delusions when one can implant the powers directly? Today, in a somewhat modified form. Oh no, I'm so screwed. The younger one gives Prime a questioning look with a raised eyebrow. Read the notes. The young Dottori turns away and begins to study the notes. Meanwhile, you tug and pull at the straps, but they remain unyielding. You need these straps are there for a reason. Imagine this needle accidentally hitting your lung instead of another organ. He looks at the syringe with an almost loving look and waves it back and forth a little. Consequences would certainly be unpleasant. The younger segment rejoins this conversation. Not to mention the fact that this would ruin the test material. You don't dare to speak the thought, but the younger man has already guessed what question might be running through your mind. You. You're the test material. And what do we do with ruin the material? Dispose. You start yanking at the bonds even fiercer, much to the amusement of Dottore's younger segment. <laughs> you really seem to be willing to gamble, huh? El Dottore looks at the syringe again, flicks it a few times, and makes sure there's no air bubbles inside. Dizziness and nausea overtake you at the sight of the needle. No matter where the contents of the syringe would end up, it certainly wouldn't be pleasant. This will be unpleasant. No matter how much you plead, no one will release you from your misery, for that would undo all the effort done so far. What if I say there must be another way? Impatiently, the Dottore on your right squints down at you while there is something in Prime's gaze that you didn't expect. Doubt. The younger man notices Prime's hesitation and starts to get restless. What are you waiting for? You need. He lowers the syringe, much to the disappointment of his younger segment. In his mind, he goes through many options, scenarios, and motives until he finally lowers the syringe completely. While you would be ideal for delusion testing, you have certain resources that open up new possibilities. Huh? Be quiet. Prime turns to you again and fixes you with his gaze. It can't get any more uncomfortable than it already is, you think, and respond to the eye contact. You are spying for the sages of the academy. And that is because... Because I may return to the academy if I am successful. Gradually, some tension falls away from you. The acute crisis could just be prevented. However, out of the corner of your eye, you can still see the syringe resting in Prime's hand. So the whole thing is not completely off the table. Prime's gaze wanders over to his younger self for a moment. A quick nod of the segment is enough for a satisfied grin to creep across Prime's face. You have one last choice. Either I'm going to do the planned experiment on you here and now, or you return to Sumeru as a double spy. You can hardly believe your ears. You have a chance to get out of here alive, but you're sure there is a catch somewhere. You'll receive trivial and partly false information that you can pass on to the sages, and so that I can be sure that you'll only do what you're supposed to, I will ensure a small guarantee. Again, he begins to grin, sending a cold shiver down your spine. There's the catch you've been looking for. What kind of guarantee? Just a little something, 
something that limits and takes over your mind in certain places, should you run the risk of revealing anything important. That doesn't sound good. Your gaze wanders over to the younger Dottore. If he had made you that offer, you would have thought directly of a lobotomy, but from Prime's mouth the words sounded a little gentler, less invasive, perhaps this is also one of those manipulative tricks. The younger Dottore leans down a bit further towards you and grins maliciously, but of course there's a risk that the installation of this guarantee could go wrong. Brain death comes pretty close to the state. Brain death comes pretty close to the state that will then occur. A similar experiment exists when performing the delusion experiment, albeit somewhat less. The needle of the syringe flashes ghostly in the glare of the lamp. Prime grins and stares at you spellbound. Which risk do you want to take? Double spy and delusion test. Oh god. Alright, let's pick the double spy. Hastily, you open your eyes. With a racing heart, you sit up and look around you in panic. You know this room. The inn! Immediately, a sharp pain shoots through your head. Straining, you squint your eyes and press your hand to the sides of your skull. What the? Your memories return abruptly. The guarantee. At this point, you feel your heart close to bursting in your chest. What exactly did he do to you? How and when were you brought back to the inn? With trembling knees, you rush out of bed, stumble over to the small mirror on the wall and look at your reflection with panic in your eyes. You look exactly as you did the night before the ball. Everything is okay. Everything is okay. As you breathe, you feel a hot, burning pain in your chest area. Trembling with fear, you pull your top down by the collar so that you have a clear view of your sternum. A clean, nearly healed cut runs vertically across your skin. You feel nauseous at the sight. Why? You don't dare touch the wound. With each breath, you see how the skin tenses and softens. Did he implant something under my skin? For a moment, you could swear to recognize unfamiliar outlines under the thin skin. You feel hot. There's still that queasy feeling in your stomach. What have you gotten yourself into? With sweaty hands, you lean along the wall over to your bag, which lies next to the bed. Feeling weak, you drop to your knees, reach into the bag, and pull out the contents piece by piece. Then, some unfamiliar pieces of paper fall into your hands. At the sight of the squiggly handwriting, everything starts to spin. Or is it the smell emanating from the ink of it? You can hardly believe your eyes as you skim over the countless lines again and again. You receive the pile of information. You can't tell if they're actually true or not. This is your ticket home. But at what price? Enjoying the view, you sit on the balcony of your home in Sumeru and gaze at the setting sun. All too well you remember the looks on the sage's face when you entered the academy and brought the pile of information with you. The events back then have already receded into the distant past, and the cut on your chest has healed to the point where only a barely visible scar remains. The sound of some birds in the twilight attracts your attention. With an attentive gaze, you watch as the small creatures glide from roof to roof with a few flaps of their wings. They are free, just as you, just as you will be soon, as you have completed your studies in a few weeks. Mumbling softly, you think aloud. Then, what then? Why stay in Subaru? Or will I travel? Thoughtfully, you rest your chin on the back of your hand and gaze dreamily towards the horizon. Traveling the world wouldn't be bad, but a familiar home has its advantages. Footsteps approach you from behind. A familiar voice makes your blood run cold. Don't think that one little mission is all that I needed you to do. Oh god. What if I pick the delusion test this time? Such a shame. You would have been the ideal for the job as a spy. At least you would have been, until getting into a serious situation. That's when your skills would have probably reached their limit. But whatever, let's continue with the plan test. The dizziness and accompanying nausea spreads throughout your body. Your vision blurs, as do all sounds that reach your ears. Still, looking up at the ceiling, you notice hasty, rapid movements out the corner of your eye. You feel detached, almost floating expecting the pain to come. Your mind does its best to protect you from it. But the feeling of being detached from your body quickly subsides as you perceive first a subtle then burning pain. The fire in your veins spreads further. With each heartbeat it invades the last fibers of your body. Every single muscle, every nerve, every cell of your body seems to be on fire. Hot and cold at the same time, the pain seems to almost crush you. 
Whether you move, yank at your bonds, or tremble, you don't know. You feel nothing but the hot sting that seeps through your body. For an infinitely long moment, there is nothing but you and the fire in your body. With each passing second, the strength you have left to fight the pain wanes. There is no rescue. No helping hand, no cooling water, and certainly no redemption. Oh, that light again. I can't feel my body. The light seems a little less blinding now, but in exchange, you have no control over your movements. When you try to lift a finger, a dull tingling sensation shoots through your entire arm. You're completely exhausted and powerless. Not even your heart has enough strength left to flutter with fear. Your entire body seems to have given up. You still have your gaze fixed on the glare of the lamp. It is bright, but there's no trace of warmth. Warmth. How beautiful it was in Sumeru. Still completely befuddled, not even a bit of fear comes over you. It is over. Done. Happened. And nothing will be able to undo what Il Dottore has done to you. The silence that is now upon you seems to almost crush you. What will happen to me now? Trying to think clearly, you fight the fog in your mind. But the harder you try, the faster your thoughts slip away. Until you finally fall into deep darkness again. The light again, and still the surgical couch in the laboratory. It could have been minutes or even days that you have been unconscious, but to your surprise, you feel a little stronger now. A strong trembling runs through your muscles as you try to lift your head. Looking down at yourself in disbelief, you notice that one of the straps on your right wrist has loosened a bit. The door at the end of the lamp flies open with a bang, causing you to jerk your head towards the source of the noise. Another incompetent guard like that, night. His eyes fall on you. Immediately, his face brightens. Ah, Yinny! Awake again! He steps closer, tilts his head, and grins with satisfaction. Your reaction to the potion was a bit strong, don't you think? You still can't think of anything to say in response, so your counterpart starts laughing. Oh yes, you probably won't have noticed any of this. Almost a pity, actually. The overall performance was extremely entertaining. What have you done to me? Oh, not much, but the effects are pretty significant. Why do you want to know that? Do you think you should be worried? Absolutely. His grin quickly disappears, leaving you to guess what may be going through his mind. Anyway, I don't have time for petty chit-chat. With his coat billowing, he turns away from you and heads for a shelf to search for something specific among bottles and boxes. While rustling and jingling sounds are heard from the corner of the room, your gaze unobtrusively wanders back to the loosening strap on your wrist. Your heart leaps as you realize that with little skill, you could actually free your hand. Immediately your mind wanders, with one free hand I could undo the other straps. Hectically, your gaze wanders over to Ildatore again. He's still standing at the shelf and has collected several vials and cans in the meantime. You wouldn't have much time to weigh your decision. Yinny will be expelled from the academy without further notice. Shoot, if I make a run for it now, I might make it out of here with my life but no evidence if at all. You know that outside the castle walls there's nothing but ice and snow waiting for you. You don't know where your winter coat is and whether you'll find your way through the endless winter wasteland. You don't know either. Abandon the opportunity. The temptation to try and escape here and now is strong, but you know better. Outside in the icy cold, you would have absolutely no chance. You watch Il Dottore attentively as he continues to rummage through the shelves. Footsteps approach from the hallway so that you involuntarily look over. Your heart leaps as you see Prime enter. He seems to have noticed your surprised look and approaches with slow steps. Kitty, back to your senses already. Also, can I just say that he looks great with this harness on? It's kind of hot. <laughs> Wordlessly, you nod as he circles the surgical table you're still lying on like a predator. I'm happy to report that the test was successful. But what does that mean for you? He strokes your right arm with his fingertips. So far, I'm not planning any follow-up tests. For which you would be suitable, well even after successful tests, it's necessary to discard the material. Oh? Surprised, he bends down a bit and takes a closer look at the strap on your right wrist. He pulls on it a few times and straightens up again and looks at you seriously. Really? Your heart begins to flutter. Should you have taken the chance to escape after all? You could have freed yourself. Do you realize that? Yes. Why didn't you free yourself? Did you stay voluntarily? 
you quickly avert your gaze. Hildatori's younger segment seems to have finished searching the shelves and is now joining the conversation. Edie could have what? It seems you missed the loose strap on the right arm. Nonsense, I... Leave. What? Leave. Prime's tone is sharp and testifies at the end of his patience. With quick steps, the younger segment hurries out of the room. He knows that Prime's patience is running out. Guinea, the tension in the air almost seems to crush you. Until just now, you thought you could have at least judged Prime a little bit, but now your self-confidence is completely gone. Without another word, Prime begins to loosen more straps. You stare at him in disbelief as the last strap is undone and you have full freedom of movement. Prime stands silently in front of you, then extends his hand to you. Aww. You surprised me. I... You had the chance, and you were aware that you could have used it. However, you decided to stay. Hesitantly, you take his hand. It's warm. Unlike my younger segment. He points over to the door with a nod. I am someone who keeps his word and is open to negotiation. He pulls you closer so that you slide off the table and land with your feet on the cold floor. Consider this a second chance. You're no longer a prisoner, nor are you a guest. Your heart leaps as he begins to grin. You are now what you claim to be, a member of the Fertimi under my command. I... I'm sure you need time to figure out what's going on now. Very well, return to your room for the time being and reflect on everything there. Tomorrow I will officially introduce you as a member. Now that the detours you took to find us have been a bit more troublesome than usual. Thoughtfully, you're led to your room by a guard. The corridors no longer seem so quite strange and threatening. Exhausted, you let yourself fall onto your bed. The events of the last few hours flash before your mind's eye like a movie. The experiments and the pain you went through seem so surreal, almost like a dream. You can't really have grasped the memories, but you're aware that it must have happened. The rest is good. Finally, your body has time to recover while your mind reflects on past events. Finally, you realize what kind of future lies ahead of you. The next day. The next day dawns. Hastily, you open your eyes and find yourself somewhat surprised in your room. You quickly stumble out of bed, go to the mirror and look at yourself. Everything is still as it should be, yet the horrors of the past days have left their traces in your mind. But apart from that, I feel good. With confusion in your eyes, you watch your reflection in the mirror. Your hairstyle is a bit messy, but otherwise, you don't look you don't look anything. You quickly change your clothes with a set you find in the closet. I don't know these clothes. You skeptically examine the soft white fabric in your hands. The clothes and how the clothes ended up in your room is a mystery to you, but you realize that you were expected to wear them. As if you're being watched, there is a knock on the door shortly after you finish changing. Irritated, your eyes fall on the door. Until now, it hadn't occurred to you to leave your room. Strange. With quiet steps, you scurry over to the door of the room and open it. Ildatore requests your presence. You stare. It seems to you as if the tests and everything you have experienced since your arrival at the castle have only been a dream. There you are back in your room. There are no scars or anything similar on you. The guard also seems to be behaving as usual. If you didn't remember so well, you would think that you just had a bad dream. But the feeling that sits deep in your mind knows better. Without an argument, you follow the guard out into the hallway. The high walls seem almost inviting by now. Silently, the masked guard leads you through the corridors to the entrance hall. You take a quick look at the heavy door that leads out to the courtyard before you disappear into another corridor. Please enter. With a small gesture, he points to the door in front of which he has stopped. For a moment, you look at the blank door handle and hesitate. What could be waiting for you behind it? Bravely, you push down the handle and step inside. <gasps> oh, it's him and it's um, Dottore and Pantalone. And therefore, I see myself perfectly justified in my actions. Pantalone lets out a soft laugh that almost amounts to a sigh. Of course. They both look up and over at you. Only now does it occur to you that maybe you should have knocked. The grin spreads across Ildatore's face. Ah, oh, Yinny, finally. He beckons you over with a small gesture. Sit down. You take a seat on the free chair next to Ildatore. While Pantalone critically examines you, Dottore begins to introduce you. 
This is Yinny, former member of the Academy in Sumeru. Pantalone nods and throws you a gentle smile. You can't tell if it's genuine. Oh, he scares me more than Tatore, I think. Tatore seems to think a lot of you. Your eyes brighten in surprise as, as Tatore lets out a low grumble. Don't respond to him. Not a word escapes your mouth. Pantalone brushes a strand of hair from his face and sighs deeply. Unusual that you allow someone like you need to move, more or less, freely from the castle. His words trigger an amused grin on Dottore's face as he turns his head towards you. He is truly something special. To decide to stay here by choice is a rarity. Pantalone chuckles with amusement. A rarity, so... This loyalty is certainly not directed to you. It's okay, it's okay. The man wearing glasses raises his hand placatingly and smiles gently. Silence returns for a moment, then Pantalone's gaze wanders over to you again. You can't guess the intentions behind his friendly smile. Dottore, dear, how do you feel about a cup of tea? Yinny? With a small gesture, he beckons you over to him. Go and have the servant in the kitchen prepare you a pot of the good tea. Return to us with the tea. Is that all? Pantalone chuckles and shoots you a smirk. Okay. You leave the room and walk straight down the long corridor. Out of the corner of your eye, you spy the courtyard of the castle. There stands a carriage. It is far more magnificent than the one in which you were brought here. It must belong to the harbinger, Pantalone. For a moment, you stop. It's a unique opportunity that presents itself to you. Okay, what happens if I get the tea and then we'll go back and try and escape from the castle? A little later, you're standing in front of the door with a tray, a teapot, and two cups on it. This time, you knock and enter the room behind. Ah, wonderful. Despite the thick walls of the castle, it is so cold that a cup of warm tea is just what I need. You place the tray on a small table, pour a cup for pantalone, and then for il dottore. Just as you hand the masked man his cup, he places his fingers on your hand. You feel your gaze rest you feel his gaze resting on you before he continues in a low voice. You saw the carriage in the courtyard, didn't you? And yet you decided to stay. He chuckles softly and lets go of your hands. He never ceased to amaze me. End Loyal. Woo! Let's load this up and escape. Try not to attract attention, you wander along the corridors until you finally reach the large entrance door. With strength, you squeeze through. Hurry out into the courtyard and climb into the carriage where the driver would otherwise have been sitting. You don't notice how exactly you navigate the carriage out of the courtyard and into the frozen wasteland. Your thoughts are constantly circling around the freedom that lies ahead of you. Finally, the excitement subsides and you come to your senses again. Wordlessly, you look around. Nothing but ice and snow surrounds you, but the horses and the carriage would somehow bring you to warmer climates. Finally, you've made it. You're free. End. A true spy. Oh, okay, so nothing awful happens to me in that end. Alright, this time I'm going to inspect the room. The closet is made of solid wood with small ornaments carved into it. You find nothing in the wardrobe itself, nor under the bed. Then your gaze lingers on the large wall mirror. You didn't notice it at first, but the longer you look, the stronger the feeling that something is wrong with it. On tiptoe, as if you were afraid someone might hear you, you approach the mirrored glass pane. With both hands, you sweep along the frame and try to push it a little to the side. The mirror doesn't move a bit, as if it had been firmly mounted on the wall. Hesitantly, you raise one hand and gently knock against it with your knuckles. A hollow, echoing sound is heard, and you immediately realize that there is a hollow space behind this mirror. That's creepy. A little startled, you flinched and are even more startled when there is a knock at the door. However, the door remains closed, so you take a closer look at the corridor behind it yourself. Okay, so here's where we get the food. Instead of exploring the castle this time, I'm just going to go straight to bed. And then we are going to arrive right at his lab, right here. So this is where we were before, but this time we didn't spy. And if we skip forward, yeah, so it's the same choices here. Are you speaking from your own experience? A surprised laugh escapes him as he spreads his arms, lavishly. What leads you to suspect this? Instinctively, your gaze wanders to the side. The fact that you have information about his past is something special. No normal member of the Fertui would ever get such information. But, well, it sounded like you've been there before. His smile quickly disappears, as if he had noticed a slight uncertainty in your voice, just when the silence seems to become stifling. 
Hitori gives a jolt and puts on his usual know it all smile. That brings back memories, doesn't it? Okay, oh, we can ask about the mirror now. There's this mirror in my room. Ah, you're very attentive, as expected. He approaches you until he's only an arm's length away. Don't worry, although there is a room for observation behind the mirror, time is valuable. Therefore, that room is always unoccupied. However, you have my respect for noticing it. Also, you seem to have curiosity as well as a seemingly basic knowledge. That's why you're here. But since you actually seem to be interested in my research. He, he turns away, runs a hand over the operating table and grins knowingly. I decided today that you'll witness a test. Surely, you've heard of the delusions, right? Okay. As much as I value quiet and concentration in my experiments, it's refreshing to occasionally impress with my skill and knowledge during practice. He wanders through the lab, opens a door you barely noticed before, and leads you into the room beyond. A shiver runs down your spine at the sight of the corpse on the operating table. The only thing that calms you in your conscience is the fact that the person is already dead. You step closer, your gaze fixed on the deceased body. Satori is standing slanted behind you and has obviously noticed your fascinated gaze. Exciting, isn't it? With a short gesture, he orders you to step back from the table. Oh yeah, it's another cutscene. Watch carefully. With one hand, he reaches for a clean scalpel lying on the small table next to him. The bright metal flashes briefly in the cold light of the lamp. There. He places the sharp blade on the corpse's ribcage. Watching him dissect the body stirs a strange fascination in you. No matter how hard you try to avert your gaze, you cannot. And it shall not remain with just this one corpse. Countless others follow. You watch each and every single one of those. The days pass and with each new morning another body lies on the now familiar surgical table. Cut by cut, organ by organ you begin to learn through watching. You're almost frightened by the fact that you follow Dottori's every movement, no matter how small, as he dissects with excitement. Every cut, no matter the tool, was a testament to his skill and knowledge. It was only a few weeks before you found yourself in your room after another session. The room had become familiar to you. However, you missed your home in Sumeru from time to time. Sumeru. You let the past weeks pass in your mind. The rejection from Academia. The ball. The invitation. And now you're sitting here, in your rather luxurious room in a castle in the middle of the ice desert. You lack nothing here, food, lodging, and of course, the opportunity to learn. Hopefully, you scratch your head. Learning wasn't that the reason why you went to the academy here in the first place. Now you can't help but wonder what your next step should be. You have learned many things about the delusions, about Dottore himself, and about his views concerning the other Harbingers. All these days, all these past days, you've been postponing the decision. But with every second of it, it becomes clearer to you that you have to make a choice. Either you stay in the castle voluntarily, and truly become the far to remember you pretended to be at the ball, or you continue your mission and gather evidence while waiting for a suitable opportunity to return to Sumeru. Oh God. Okay. Okay. Let me let me cancel the mission this time. The next few days fly by. Day after day, you observe more experiments and learn more and more. Your interest is genuine, and Dottore doesn't overlook that either. Every now and then, he asks you questions about the procedures, which you often answer to his satisfaction. In the meantime, you're learning and living in the castle, and with each passing day, it becomes more of a home to you. You often still miss Sumeru, but your homesickness is quickly quenched with new and exciting knowledge. Your efforts to absorb, Process and reproduce all the information do not go unnoticed, neither by Prime nor by its other segments. Whatever you, whenever you encounter them, they seem less and less hostile. As they become accustomed to your presence, you become used to their presence too. Even your helping hands, in terms of cleaning surgical instruments, seem to be a welcome help to Dottore's younger segment with the strange mask. After a long tiring day, you enter your room exhausted. From the hallway, you say goodbye to Dottore's segment, which had accompanied you up here. You did a good job today. I thought your moral code would hinder you, but you seem to be doing well. Amused, he laughs and waves goodbye. 
Prime is very pleased with your performance as well. Then he disappears and leaves you alone. Thoughtfully, surrounded by silence, you wander up and down the room. You may have cancelled your mission, but something still burdens you. The feeling of hiding something from Prime in his segments is giving you sleepless nights. You can gather all your courage and tell Prime about your original mission and your change of heart. Or you could keep your secret. Let's tell the truth this time. The day is over, yet you know you cannot sleep. Instead of getting ready for the night, you leave your room. Hence, you make your way to the place where you find Prime most of the time. Without having to look for him, you find him standing in the middle of the lab. Concentrated, he rummages through a pile of papers. He casually comments on your appearance with a smile. It's getting late. You should go to sleep. I know. Tell me, what keeps you awake at this hour? Puts the notes aside and turns to you. You now find his presence soothing rather than threatening, as you did just a few weeks ago. We need to talk. Uh-huh. Amused, he chuckles and leans against the table. You don't quite know how to start. Back then at the ball, the thing about La Signora. Notorio puts his hand to your chin and gently caresses your cheek with his thumb. So what's troubling my best scholar? Hmm? Is there something you've kept from me? Oh god. My, my original reason for going to the ball was not because I was invited as a Fatui member. He nods, still smiling. So you begin to wonder how much he actually knows. In the meantime, I decided to stay here voluntarily, but at the beginning. Have you been searching for me on the orders of the Academia? Your breath is taken away. Open mouth, you stare at the masked man. He chuckles amusedly. Your confession does not seem to surprise him. My dear Yuni, do you really think I don't know about this by now? You have spent quite some time here. Time that I have used to have your story checked over. Now he puts his second hand on your cheek. Even though he already knew the truth, you're relieved. What would you have done if I had never told you the truth? I'm sure you can guess. Believe me, you made the right decision. Oh god. He gently brushes your cheek and gives you a little pat. Do you think you can go to sleep now? Or do you want to stay a little while longer? You nod gently as he takes a little distance from you. A soft smile spreads across your lips. There's still much to learn. Amused, Satori chuckles. Puts a hand on your back and leads you into the well-known room next door where an untouched corpse awaits its autopsy. Ah, Okay, I know that we're holding hands above a corpse and we're doing, like, bad experiments. But this is kind of cute. <laughs> what is wrong with me? There is still much you can learn from me. Woohoo! Okay, so that was Apprentice Ending. What if I cancel the mission, but I don't tell him? The next day dawns. As usual, you prepare for the upcoming tests in which you're allowed to assist. The thought that you're withholding the truth from Dottore still lurks in the back of your mind, but you make your decision. Shortly after, you arrive at the lab on time. Dottore is already waiting for you. Here you are at last. You took your time. I would have never believed that. Okay, so we're in the autopsy room now. What do you mean? To ever meet someone like you, in fact. I'm grateful for La Signora's death. An amused laugh escapes his throat as he prepares for the autopsy. This seems to be something like destiny after all. I feel like I'm in danger. Then he beckons you over to him. Come here. There's still much you can learn from me. Yeah, so if we don't cancel the mission, we still get the apprentice ending. Alright, what if we continue the mission? Okay. So we head over to his lab. You enter the almost empty room. No one is there except the corpse and you. Il Dottore? You look around searchingly. He's not in the other room either. Pondering, you step closer to the corpse and look at it thoughtfully. I wonder who that could have been. Where did he come from? What were his dreams? Footsteps sound behind you. You are early. Surprised, you startle out of your thoughts. He opens his mouth to add something, but your obviously thoughtful expression surprises him. Instead of addressing that, he walks over to the corpse and sweeps his fingertips over the scalpels at the ready. I have something special planned for today. Oh no. He swallow, the thought of the mission even he weighs even heavier on you now. What would the sages say if they knew that you had witnessed the autopsy of several, presumably innocent, dead people? Your gaze wanders over to the surgical instruments. There are some new items there that you don't know. In particular, a syringe filled with luminous liquid catches your attention. 
You have already been able to gather quite a bit of knowledge. I assume that by now you could perform a complete autopsy on your own. He lifts a syringe and holds it up to the light and his grin widens. Let's bring a dead man back to the realm of the living today. Then, he lowers the syringe, puts it back in its place and points to the unused surgical mask and fresh vinyl gloves. Your heart stops. You stare in disbelief at the still dead man in front of you. Are you serious? Tori laughs briefly. There's a bit of mischievousness in his voice. Go ahead. Or are you afraid? What happened to your previous fascination? His grin disappears. All at once it gets cold around you, yet you notice how your hands start to get sweaty. Or was your fascination just pretend? By the archons he knows. How does he know I'm spying? Do they have plenty of... Do they have the background story the sages gave me checked? You quickly put on a nervous smile. No, no. I just don't think I'm ready to perform such an experiment. Knowing full well that your facade is already crumbling, the Tori gets dangerously close to you. Prove your interest to me. With a nod, he points to the instruments. Don't be shy. Oh god, okay. Perform the experiment. With a few but tense movements, you put on the mask and the gloves. Your gaze is constantly fixed on the dead body in front of you. You reach for the syringe and apply it to the corpse with a surprisingly steady hand. For a moment, you hesitate. You realize you have no choice if you want to keep your guard up. Biting your lip, you stab the cold metal into the dead, now waxy skin of the test subject. The glowing liquid disappears beneath the thin layers of skin, so you pull the needle out and take a few steps back. You have broken the rules of the Academia. Both you and Tutoria are aware of this, so he leans over your shoulder and whispers words to you in a soft, low voice. You really did it. What do you think the sages will say about that? Do you think they would accept you back into the academy? A harsh laugh escapes his throat as heat rises up to your head. You just blew your last chance to return to academy. If they really wanted your mission to succeed, they would have given you a better disguise. But your mission was probably never designed for a period of several weeks. He waits a moment for your answer, but the shock still sits firmly in your bones. The realization that you're no longer welcome anywhere throws you completely off track. Your hands are now soaked in blood. Then you feel his hands on your shoulders. Where do you want to go now? You remain silent and he begins to chuckle again. Welcome home. Oh no, I feel bad. And guilty. Let me refuse to do the experiment this time. With wide eyes and trembling hands, you squint at the sharp blades. No matter how hard you try to move, you remain rooted to the spot. Well, that's disappointing. He wanders around the room until he disappears from your field of vision and stops behind you. His voice is close. Very close. Then my original feeling about you and your loyalty was right after all. A deep sigh escapes him. It's a shame. Really, a shame. But unfortunately, it can't be helped. Or perhaps I could. Who oh, no. Whether this time it was the dizziness or the sharp pain in the back of your neck that sends you into unconsciousness, you can't tell. Hastily, you open your eyes. This room again. But instead of the operating table, you find yourself on a more or less comfortable chair in the middle of the room. Out of the corner of your eye, you see the surgery table. Just the sight of it is enough to make you sweat. You need. A familiar voice snaps you out of your thoughts, causing your gaze to dart around for a few moments until you calm down a bit. I know what you need. A sinking feeling spreads in the pit of your stomach. What would come next? Weren't the pain in the previous tests enough? The Dottori steps a little closer and tilts his head. You pretended to be a member of the Fatui during the ball, but inside you were never one of us. He raises his hand and puts his fingers to your chin, forcing you to look at him. I have my methods, which I can really make you a loyal Fatui member. He lets go of you, disappears from your sight, and starts some preparations. Unlike most of the other tests I usually do on a daily basis, this one is probably the most pleasant. All of a sudden, his voice is close to your ear. You won't notice anything, because you won't be awake at all during this time. A hot stabbing pain spreads across the back of your neck. This feeling quickly spreads throughout your entire body. The initial burning sensation then turns into a surprisingly pleasant tingling sensation which then finally rises up into your head and begins to cloud your mind. Not particularly entertaining, but extremely effective. We would happen to be. Okay, we're back in our room. 
Okay, so this this seems to be the similar ending with um Pantalone, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, so this is the same ending, except you don't have your free will anymore. You have to obey everything he says. Because the choices to stand and everything else is just like Yeah, blanked out. Yeah, see? As if by magic your body starts to move. You take a seat on the free chair next to Il Dottore. While Pantalone critically examines you, Dottore begins to introduce you. Yeah, so this is all just the same. Not a word escapes your mouth. Yeah. So it's all just obey. I can't even escape anymore. I can't do anything except for like get the tea. Yeah, so we return to them with the tea. Well, Dottore says, I told you, my methods are extremely... Uh, I told you, my methods are extremely effective. Obedient. Oh god, okay. Um, so we've gotten Decline Invitation, Double Spy, Guilty, True Spy, Apprentice, Obedient, and Loyal. We've got three more that we haven't gotten yet. Okay, what if I just watch him? You keep your distance and watch every movie makes. All the other guests are happily chatting, eating, and dancing. El Dottore stands at the edge of the crowd, silently watching. Suddenly, you feel a tap on your shoulder. Swiftly, you turn around and gasp. Il Dottore. Correct. Oh god. Your gaze wanders back to the other Il Dottore. He's still there. His slightly younger looking version in front of you snaps his fingers impatiently. You don't seem to be having a lot of fun. Before you can retort anything, he places one of his hands on your back and pushes you, more or less gently, back into the hallway. Wait, what? As you two walk along the corridor, the noise from the ballroom gets more quiet with every step. You seem like you were hoping to talk to me. Oh god. Okay. Actually, I... What's wrong? Did I mess up your plan? You take a step back, surprised. No, I'm just surprised to meet you and you, I guess. After La Signora's passing, I was reassigned to serve under your command. Ah, of course. Il Dottore, is there anything to do for me? I, I can feel his gaze on me. Am I sweating? Out of the corner of your eye, you notice a swift movement and a sharp pain in your ears rapidly spreading through your head. You feel dizzy while your body suddenly goes numb and you fall. Oh no! At least something made up for the time that I wasted here. Lord Harbinger, the carriage is prepared. Perfect! Take our lovely guest outside. I'll be waiting. Oh no! Hang on a second! Aww! You didn't know how long you slept, but it surely wasn't a comfortable rest. Finally, you regain consciousness bit by bit, but you still feel like you're wrapped in batting wool. A warm, dull feeling fogs your mind while you squint hard at the bright light above you. A lamp? Walls? Cold, bare walls. With some effort, you manage to realize that you're lying on an icy, cold floor made of metal. The room you're in is small, without furniture, and has only one piercing lamp on the ceiling. You hear a low, muffled buzzing. But whether it's real or just an after effect of the drug, you can't tell. Your whole body hurts, especially your neck. Gradually, your memories return. The village, the ball, Il Dottore. Heavily, you touch the spot on the back of your neck that hurts the most. But to your surprise, you bump into something unexpected. Cold metal, a faint rattling sound. It's definitely a metal collar on a chain. Okay, that's kind of kinky. Still half stunned, you manage to turn your head and spot the wall to which the iron chain is attached. With trembling fingers, you grasp the chain and give it a test tug, but with the limited strength at your disposal right now, you have no chance. The rattle of the chain seems to have caught someone's attention. At the very least, you hear echoing footsteps that seem to come from the other side of the sturdy looking door on the opposite wall. The footsteps fall silent, and you hear the rattling of a bunch of keys. With a jerk, the metal panel opens. You recognize him. He seems to be the auditore who has shown himself most in public in the past. Still trembling, you try to sit up, but the coordination of arms and legs doesn't quite work yet. Watching your pathetic attempts, the young version of Il Dottore grins with amusement. The drug does not seem to be doing you any good, I had expected a little more resistance. Where am I? 
As hard as you try, your lips are so numb that you cannot utter a word. Still watching your attempts to sit up, the young man shakes his head with a laugh. I really expected more. After all, you seem to have piqued his interest. The tingling sensation in your arms and legs gradually subsides. So now you can feel the cold floor beneath your fingertips. Il Dottore is standing in the middle of the door, which is wide open. He knows very well there is no possibility of escape for you at the moment. You seem a little confused, huh? It should be clear to you why you're here. I don't know. You open your mouth, but nothing can be heard except an indefinable sound. No chance to speak up. Once again, a laughter escapes Il Dottore. Whatever the reason may have been, your physical condition is certainly not the cause. The only remaining possibility is that he saw something interesting in your mind. Well, whether he was wrong about that remains to be seen. In any moment, you don't make a particularly bright impression right now. He turns on his heel, leaves the cell and shuts the door slowly. You'll soon make other acquaintances, assuming that you'll survive the next few hours. Don't run away, understand? Acting surprised, he laughs out loud and falls into a spiteful giggle. Oh, well, you can't. With a gesture, he points to your neck. By the way, entertain me, us, if you want to keep all your limbs. What? Then he closes the door, turns the key in the lock and disappears. With quick steps, silence falls. Oppressive silence. The buzzing in your head is still there, preventing you from thinking, while the remaining numbness paralyzes your body. The state lasted, you cannot say. Time passes sluggishly. How long have you been sitting here? Several hours? A few days? Your stomach begins to grumble, your throat becomes progressively drier. How long would he leave you sitting here? When would you have the opportunity to get out of here again? Finally at last, you hear footsteps approaching. At first you can't believe your ears, then you clearly hear the key turning in the lock of the door. Il Dottore, but another one, older than your last visitor. He stands quietly in the doorway for a while. Whether he looks at you, he can't tell. Then he enters, removes the key and lets the door fall into the lock behind him. With slow, very slow steps, he comes closer. Obviously, he's waiting for your reaction to his presence. Remain quietly seated. Il Dottore slows his steps again, but you remain sitting still and rigid. An almost gentle smile creeps onto Il Dottore's lips. He is different from his previous visitor, completely changed. Then he stands in front of you, looks down at you wordlessly. With slow gentle movements he kneels down and apparently fixes his gaze on you. As if in a trance, he lifts one hand, places it gently on your cheek and strokes down to your chin barely noticeable. So you're the new… what did he call it? Ah yes, plaything. His initially gentle smile turned into a wry grin. Aren't you curious about what lies behind this door? You're lucky because now the time has come for me. But you're lucky because now the time has come for you to leave your small cold cell. Don't look at me like that. What are you? A domesticated puppy or a tiger in captivity? You stare at him with wide eyes. So he starts to laugh softly. Again, he gently strokes your cheek with one hand. You're wondering where he is, aren't you? Prime, I mean. True. Where? Before you can complete your sentence, he puts an index finger to your lips, silencing you. Soon. He'll take time for you soon. He hasn't revealed why he chose you yet, but there aren't many options. Finding new material was the only reason he attended the ball. This time, unfortunately, it was you. His hand moves to the chain with the collar that holds you close to the wall. Ready for a short trip, little tiger? A dull, loud buzzing pierces your head, making you dizzy and turning your vision black. Sweet dreams. I don't know what's gonna happen to me. Wait, I'm back on the operating table. Little Dottore? Finally awake. You took your time. A harsh laugh resounds in the room. It has come to my attention that you requested to see me. Little Dottore, I mean, Prime? Precisely. The footsteps get closer and out of the corner of your eye you can spot him standing next to you. He's wearing different clothes and at the cell and now looks confusingly like the last visitor in your cell. Could it have been him who visited you there? Who knows? Well, time is scarce and especially I am aware of the fact. I have a tight schedule and already give you more attention than you deserve. He grins as he brushes the back of your hand with his fingertips. Nevertheless, here I am against the advice of my other selves. Oh god!
His hand wanders further up and pauses where the strap ties your wrist to the table. The following scene can either be pleasant or unpleasant. It entirely depends on your decision. You open your mouth to ask a question, but your tutorial is not giving you a chance. What decision I mean? Whether you, co whether, whether you cooperate with me or not. Of course, all options are open to me to force you to collaborate, but where's the fun in all that? After all, it's the expected resistance that makes things really interesting. He turns away from you and searches for something outside of your field of vision. You recognize the sound of him putting on a pair of fresh vinyl gloves, and he appears in your sight again. A new test subject, new things to discover. You certainly don't object to a little investigation, do you? No? Bravo. And I hope you won't obey all my commands blindly because that would be anything but entertaining. And so he begins. The first shackles come loose, giving you some movement of freedom. Carefully and unusually quiet, he inspects your body, starting with your hands. To your surprise, he's very gentle and careful. The slight touch of his fingertips on your skin gives you goosebumps. He seems to somehow know more about your physical condition. And you start to wonder if he knows more about you than you thought. For a moment, he turns away, walking over to a tiny table with various medical instruments. Your gaze quickly drifts over to the other side, the door, only a few meters away. What happens if I try to escape? Without another thought, you jump off the table and dash over to the door on shaky legs. Fear fogs your mind as you focus the exit with wide eyes. Instantly, the blood rushes to your head and only a few moments later, you lose the ground underneath your feet. Huh, just as expected. Well, let's forget this little incident and continue with the agenda. Still half conscious, you feel his hands grabbing your arms as he drags you back to the table and restrains your body again. He holds a scalpel in his hand, which flashes in the harsh light of the lamp. Your tutorial pauses in his movements, eagerly awaiting your reaction, and then yank at the restraints. Satisfied, he grins, steps closer to you, and caresses your stomach with the tips of his fingers. I could end your life here and now, but that would be no fun. With slow, controlled movements, he puts the scalpel aside and supports himself with his hands on the table. You have a choice. Either I test your physical resistance or your psychological resistance. Or neither. Which one do you choose? Physiological tests. Very well. I love seeing test subjects volunteering for testing. That was not what... Shh. Don't ruin this moment. Everything is ready and I'm sure you can't wait to be of use for me. Am I right? He steps closer to the surgery table and leans down a bit, so that the tips of his hair almost brush your nose. In a lowered voice, he continues, I am sure that we can both accomplish great things. I plan and perform the experiments while you enable me to do so by volunteering your body and mind to me. Your thoughts race, your heart seems to burst. You realize that he's completely insane. And the worst thing is, you don't know yourself whether he's right with what he said or not. By the Archons, what is he even thinking? This man is delusional. Il Dottori interprets your short silence correctly, so he starts to grin. Doubts? It was you who volunteered for my tests, wasn't it? You appear to be a stranger to your own motivations, for you seem to be surprised, even astonished. And pleasantly, almost crushingly gentle, he strokes your cheek with his fingerprints. I know exactly the way you think. You're tired. Tired of all the work, the obligations. You want nothing more than to be appreciated. No one recognizes your efforts and shows acknowledgement for what you- You just want to be valued for what you are. Because you no longer have the strength to simply shine through extraordinary performance. You're simply too exhausted. And yet, you look for confirmation and praise and completely waste yourself in the process. You pretend and force yourself to do things that are not profitable at all. His words are unpleasant. Not because of his completely twisted views, but because there is more in them than you want to admit. His voice has something reassuring about it that you didn't notice before. You can let yourself go. Relax. Because distorted results are the last thing I need. Gently, his gloved hand rests over your eyes. Of course, you're aware that such important attempts bring pain from time to time. But since you made it this far, it shouldn't be anything you can't bear. All of a sudden, you feel how tired you are, your whole body crying out for rest. Despite the fear that you might die here, this place doesn't seem quite as strange to you as it did before. Don't worry, you're more of use to me alive than dead. Your mind is unique, so it'd be a shame not to gain an even deeper insight into the abyss of your soul. As you gradually drift into deep sleep, his voice accompanies you. After some time, you awaken, he or someone else 
has taken you back to your cell. The metal chain is gone. Instead, you notice that you're now lying on a soft blanket rather than the cold floor. Oh, yay. Thanks for giving me a blanket. You're alive. He has kept his word. Unconsciously, you seem to have been awakened at the sound of approaching footsteps. Because just at that moment, the door to your cell opens. Ah, awake again? You nod and sit up. Only now you feel how hungry you are and wince accompanied by the grumbling of your stomach. Hildatori rolls his eyes and starts scratching his head with one hand. That that you mere mortals always have to eat is pretty lame. Waste of resources and time. Of course, one can put this time to good use. Although this Ildatori had no empathy for you, he continued providing you with food he brought along. The meal was simple and tasteless, but it kept you alive. Nevertheless, he did not allow you to leave your cell. The Prime seems to really fancy you. Surprising, because he's not really one to rush things. Ildatori turns away from you and opens the door to leave your cell. This will be a chance to escape, maybe even the last one. Start escape attempt. Hmm, okay. Faster than you can think, you jump up and rush towards the door. Ildatori sees your quick movements out the corner of his eye. Just as you reach him, a familiar feeling of dizziness overcomes you, causing you to lose ground and fall. Just as expected. Again, hours pass without anything happening. You realize that Ildatori, whether prime or not, has many obligations and such. And although Ildatori's presence triggers nervousness in you, you prefer his presence to the solitude in the cell. This thought worries you. What sane person would wish for the company of a lunatic? Finally, you catch yourself thinking that it's not just a stifling loneliness. It's Prime himself. That aura, that spark of unpredictability, is what makes you curious. A sudden knock on the door snaps you out of your thoughts. Who's there? You hear a soft familiar chuckle and the click of the lock. The door swings open and Prime, or so you assume, enters. I see you're awake and seemingly invigorated thanks to the small meal. You nod, but remain seated. Your thoughts are already circling around your suspicions as to why he might have sought you out. From the look in your eyes, he seems to be able to guess your thought process and tilts his head. Don't clutter your little mind with thoughts of what could possibly be. Calm down. You don't have to think anymore. You just have to do what I ask of you. Believe me, you'll like it. Ildatore steps closer and looks down at you silently, thoughtfully. Are you bored? Mm, not in your presence. He seemed to have settled in quickly. Excellent. Behind his back, he pulls out a long, wide ribbon. I have some things planned, but not for here. Following his small hand gesture, you rise and now stand silently in front of him. You yourself notice how tense you are and ponder what he might have planned. This is purely a precautionary measure. Even though it's unlikely that you'll ever tell anyone about this, I must make sure that you see as little of this place as possible. Gently. He lifts the ribbon and blindfolds you with it while you hold, while you hold still in anticipation. You know how right he is. Never again will you leave this place, and no one will miss you. Your goals, your studies, your dreams, all that has become meaningless. You are nothing but the property of the harbinger before you. Then you feel his hand on your back as he leads you out of the cell. You can't tell how many steps you took, but neither of you loses a word on the way to your destination. Hearing the opening of a door near you, you then feel the threshold beneath your feet. Then the ribbon around your head loosens and returns your vision. This place will soon be familiar to you as it is to me, believe me. What feeling you'll associate with this room is entirely up to you. You settle down on a chair illuminated by a bright light while Dottori slips on new vinyl gloves. Well, we have a lot planned, so let's not waste any time. Hours, days and weeks follow, which you spend with experiments. It is usually unpleasant, but... Quitting now is out of the question. The progress you make in exploring and improving delusions makes Ildatori surprisingly pleased. The other segments you encounter from time to time view you with a mixture of suspicion and fascination. They think the time Prime devotes to you is wasted, but the successes you're achieving makes them curious. A few hours a day in the lab turn into more until you end up eating and sleeping there. The same goes for Prime, whose behavior increasingly resembles an obsession. He loves his research and skips meals or other things for the sake of it. How long has it been since you first woke up in your cell is unclear. Your hair is getting longer and longer, so that is the only clue you have for estimating. Prime also realizes that time is passing. Time. Something that he has a special connection to. He doesn't seem to worry about his own aging, but he realizes that the same is not true for you. 
from time to time you think back to your initial mission and can't help but look at Tori's work with a certain unusual interest. The papers he scribbles on, the small notes he adds, all of this would have been more than enough to get you back into the academy earth. Still, as time passes, the cold bare walls become familiar to you, just like Dottori himself. Yinny, come here. What is it? About the research on the delusions. Our progress is becoming progressively less and less, am I right? Don't worry, it's exhausting, but I can stand it. That's not what this is about. You feel him run a hand over your head. Time. It's about your time. You've been able to gather some knowledge about the other segments and their creation by now, haven't you? His hand lingers on your shoulder as he looks thoughtfully at the door. You still have enough time left, but I do not intend to let it get that far. What are you thinking about? There is still so much unexplored, so much that your time would never be enough for. I'm going to change that. Close your eyes and do as I say. As you wish. He leads you by the hand through the lab, up a metal step, and then lets go of you. For a moment, you stand still and wait, feeling the cold metal under your feet. Then a hiss follows, accompanied by a mechanical hum. After that, everything falls silent. Muffled as if through thick glass, you hear Ildatori's voice. Don't stop breathing, no matter what. You nod as you feel something wet on your feet. The liquid continues to rise, and you know that the glass cylinder in which you're standing is closed at the top. The room fills rapidly with the cold liquid so that it soon reaches your neck. Ah, hello, cat. I'm reading. I'm reading for everybody. Remember, keep breathing. Again you nod while your heart beats like crazy. It's too late to flee now. There is no turning back. The cold water now completely fills the glass chamber in which you're floating. You gather all your courage and take a breath. The liquid enters your airways and spreads through your lungs. No matter how much you believe in Tatori's words, you begin to fidget and twitch. Air. You need air. Panic thoughts overtake you as a stabbing pain swells in your lungs. Get out. Immediately. Your entire mind is screaming for help, but all that escapes from your mouth are the last bubbles of air from your lungs. The pain gradually subsides as your body comes to rest. Yinny. Look at me. The next time you wake up, nothing will be the same as it was. Tiredness takes over your body once more. You try to keep your eyes open as hard as you can, but deep, dark sleep that awaits you cannot be defeated. End. Immortal. Woohoo! Um, okay, so we're at the point again where you have discovered the loosened strap on your wrist, and we are going to try and escape this time. You have made your decision. You would dare to attempt this escape, even if it would be your last. Striving to be free, you tug at the strap until your hand finally comes free. Immediately, adrenaline rushes through your veins, accompanied by the rapid pounding of your heart. My last chance. Once again, you glance over at Ildatore. He's still standing with his back to you, and seems not to have noticed anything. This is a test. Even if it is, you think, it's too late to back out now. Silently, you remove the remaining straps, so that to your own surprise, a few seconds later, you place the tips of your bare feet on the cold floor. Shifting your weight to your feet, you slide off the operating table hastily. Your gaze wanders over to the door. It's open. That Dottori fortunately didn't close it after he entered the laboratory. Il Dottori is still busy with the shelf. Near him, but out of his sight, you discover some components that appear to be parts of disassembled ruin guards. One of those parts is a long metal pipe. Uncertainly, your gaze wanders back and forth between the pipe and the door. But sneak out of the lab this time, and then we'll come back and attack him and see what happens. You tiptoe over to the open door. Your heart is beating so loudly that you're afraid Il Dottori might hear it. As if spellbound, your gaze is fixed on him as you continue to approach the door backwards. Even the smallest movement, even the softer sound, could attract his attention. Then you finally stand in the empty hallway. Still, with a pounding heart and sweaty palms, you stare towards the entrance of the lab as you move further and further away from this hell-like place. Your steps become larger, then faster and louder. The last bit of your rational mind has left you in the face of an escape possibility. Your footsteps echo off the bare walls as you stumble through the hallways. Your gaze sweeps the narrow windows. Too small, I won't fit through it. Again you hustle on, leaving hallway after hallway behind you. Then finally, you stand in the large entrance hall. Immediately your eyes dart over to the double door through which you entered the castle back then. Without thinking, you run over to it, grasp the handles with both hands and tug at them with all your strength. 
It opens. Cold, icy wind beats against you as you run across the courtyard to the stone arch. Behind it lies freedom. As fast as your feet will carry you, you run across the frost-covered ground, past the stone arch, and are free. Without stopping, you run on. You don't feel the cold of the eternal winter, only the adrenaline that shoots through your muscles, which makes you run on without thinking. Between the snowflakes whizzing past you, you fight your way through the winter wilderness. But with each step, the elation in your body wears off. Little by little, your strength leaves until you finally come to a complete stop. Silently, you look around. The outlines of the castle are no longer visible. Even your footprints begin to fade. Only now can you think clearly again while the biting cold gnaws at you. With blurred vision, you look at your pale, trembling hands. You have clearly underestimated the icy cold out here. Turning your gaze again to the invisible horizon, you mutter powerlessly, Where am I? Oh, we're just frozen. We just die if we escape without the carriage. Okay, we're back here now. Let's try and see what happens when we attack Dottori. With trembling knees, you creep over to the pipe. As your hand grasps the cold metal, you wince as if the coldness inside would bite you. Millimeter by millimeter, you pull the pipe out of the pile without making a sound. Luck seems to be on my side. Then you fix Dottori with your watchful gaze. His back turned to you, he curses softly as he can't seem to find what he needs on the shelf. Tap, tap. You approach him, step by step. Tap, tap. He's almost within reach. You are now standing behind him, the pipe raised high above your head. Still inattentive, Il Dottori looks at the small bottle in his hands. This is your chance. Whack. The pipe rushes down. A dull sound resounds from the laboratory as Il Dottori slumps down. Still full of tension, you stare down at his unconscious body while your hands hold the pipe tightly. You stagger back with a step or two, then you exhale in relief and a smile creeps onto your lips. I... I did it. You drop the pipe, turn around on the spot and are about to run to the open door when... Uh oh. I know exactly what I'm gonna do with you. Hastily, you open your eyes. This room again. But instead of the operating table, you find yourself on a more or less comfortable chair in the middle of the room. This gets you back to the pantalone ending. Yep. Yeah. See? Yeah, so it gets you back to the pantalone ending where you get your choices taken away from you. Okay, so that's where the path diverges to. Okay, alright. This time I kept the notes instead, instead of burning them. So he actually has them. So we're going to see what happens. He's holding your backpack, which you had left in your room at the inn before the ball. A satisfied grin spreads across Ildatori's face. You recognize his bag, don't you? You nod at a loss for words. He knows more than you had assumed. A lot more. Still grinning, he pulls some papers from your luggage and waves them in the air. Let's talk about your mission. I can explain. Uh-uh. Silence. He does not unfold the pieces of paper. But both he and you know what's written inside. He knows your reason for being at the ball. This eliminates your right to vote for the following tests. But the answer was quite enlightening. I had no choice. I happened to come across your old notes in the Academy of Archives and was wrongly accused of breaking the rules. I just want to go back to the Academy and finish my studies. He puts the bag and the letters aside and folds his hand together. His usual grin fades. Hmm. Poor thing. What do you mean? The world is a chessboard, and you are nothing more than a pawn sacrificed by the sages for political purposes. You don't know what to reply. There seems to be something else you don't know about. You really thought you had a chance to return to the Academy, didn't you? You believed them, and blindly followed their orders. Too bad. They never intended for you to return. Didn't they tell you that they wanted to contact me for cooperation? Didn't they tell you that you were merely a sign of the sage's goodwill to me? He bursts out laughing, sending a shiver down your spine. They tricked you, fooled you all the way down the line. Almost tragic, don't you think? Again, he caresses the skin on your stomach with his fingertips. Your gaze hangs as if in a trance on the mask of the man for whom you're nothing more than a political gesture. That's a good thing. I can make good use of somebody like you. Ah, uh, no. I have an excellent use for a body like yours for one, maybe two tests. You feel the cold blade on your skin. This is certainly not the happy ending you were hoping for. However, you've given me good entertainment for a while. You can be satisfied with your performance. But here, and now, the curtain falls. Gift of goodwill. God damn it. I'm just a political gift at this point. God, I loved that so much. 
I've never played Genshin before because I've always only just played Honkai, but I really, really enjoyed that. I've heard some things about Dottore while I was playing this because my friends told me, but he's not the best dude, as I can, you know, clearly tell from this. But this was so well made. The dev works so hard on it. There's so much art in this. The sprites look amazing. There's so many expressions and so many branching paths, like 10 endings for a free game. That is wild. It's taken me about, I'd say, two hours to get every single ending, but I loved every moment of it. If you are a big fan of Genshin Impact, this is a must play. If you love Yandere type stories or just visual novels in general, I would highly recommend this. Thank you so much for sitting with me and listening while I got every single ending in this visual novel. If you guys liked the video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. If you have any suggestions as to what I can play next, feel free to leave a comment below. It really does help the channel grow as well, and I'd be super duper grateful. If you want to hang out outside of these videos, I also stream on Twitch four times a week, so you are more than welcome to join myself and my lovely, wonderful community. But that's all for now. Thank you so much again for your time. I hope you enjoyed the story. 